from the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris here on a Tuesday. How is your morning going so far? A little cooler out this morning, but not as much rain as yesterday, at least so far, whatever the case. Sit back and join us on the program today. We're going to be talking about elder care, elder law, that realm of the law that is growing like leaps and bounds, thanks courtesy to the baby boomers and others. As we live longer and longer, there are certain things you have to consider either for yourself or for loved ones who are aging. And there's a whole segment of the law that specializes in those types of considerations. And I should say that we have here in Middle Tennessee, I think one of the foremost, I think, legal practices in the country that specializes in this, started by none other than Tim Takis, and now two other fine attorneys have joined him there, along with a full staff, including Barbara McGinnis, who is joining us by Zoom this morning. And uh, hi High praise indeed. I don't want to give you a big head, Barbara, but I think it's fair to say that your legal practice there, along with Tim and Chris, is one of the best known legal elder care practices in the country. Fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Um, Tim was absolutely a pioneer in elder law and the development of our practice model that we call life care planning. Um, he and the team here have mentored probably 170 attorneys, maybe 180 attorneys from all over the nation. Uh, and those are just the folks that have actually visited here to shadow with us and see how we run our law practice. It is unique. Yeah. And he's um, and Deborah King, one of our social workers and elder care coordinators, they are very involved in training programs through the Life Care Planning Law Firms Association um, so that there's many hundreds of other folks that have been impacted by Tim's design here. And we're just honored to be part of it and to continue the practice model so that it will grow and be a resource for our community you know, one day he will retire. <laughs> it's not in the plans, but uh, one day he'll retire and we will just carry right on. Oh, I think so. Well, I, you're right. I, I know that Tim, and I think maybe you do some of this, but he's traveled the country talking at seminars. And, uh, you know, I've learned so much from you guys when you come on the program. I appreciate you coming on. And we're going to take phone calls as always. If folks want to join in the conversation, 737-7587. But I like to do this periodically. I mean, we have folks, you and Tim and Chris and others on every month or so. But every once in a while, I want to remind folks exactly what elder law is and who it is you can work with. So give us the primer when someone is asking you, so what kind of law do you practice, Barbara? Explain that to me and the types of things you help people with. Right. We help families or clients make sure that they're uh, getting good care. You know, Tim likes to say we help folks take care of their mom. Um, and to kind of unpack that, it means that we do a lot of estate planning work and we help families that are pre-planning with asset protection work. Um, but we also help folks that are navigating that care continuum. They need to know how and where to find care and sometimes how to pay for care. So elder law is not just about older adults, though primarily it is. It's about helping people with chronic illness disabilities um, that need care in that long-term care realm, whether it's care at home or in facilities like assisted livings or nursing homes, and that we're advocating for good care all the time, teaching our clients how to be advocates for their family members, giving them the legal tools to do that, and then helping with public benefits. Yeah. Yeah, the legal tools are the key. Power of attorney, wills, and all this. I got to be honest with you, Barbara. Before you even came into the realm, I remember, and Tim and I were doing this for years, you know, when he first really got started mm -hmm. here, and he's been coming on this program. And I thought, wait, elder law, wait a second. Now, I know we have an older audience that watches this show in the morning, which is great, but I'm like, what? You know, all right. And from my perspective, being selfish, I was like, why do I care? Boy, have I learned with time, and, and I'm so glad I started learning early enough. One way or another, 
all of us are going to be dealing with the very things you're talking about right now, either for ourselves or for a loved one. And I'm thinking, well, I'm okay. Okay, I've got a little will here and beyond that. What else do I need? Well, I didn't realize my parents who are now needing care and have started having some memory issues, I didn't know the concept of how important it was to get power of attorney, both, you know, physical or rather, you know, for health and financial. These kind of things. Right. I mean, it, it's tangible. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, Nick, okay, I'm going to turn the channel now. because Well, trust me, you can find out now or you can find out later the hard way. Right, Barbara? Right, right. I, mean, I think there's a quote by Rosalind Carter that says, you're either a caregiver. Everybody's either a caregiver now or in the future or right. they're receiving care. You know, I mean... It, I really botched that quote, but the point is <laughs> it, it will impact you at some point in time in your life and unless, mm. I don't know, maybe you're really young, you're yeah. really lucky or you die young. I don't know which. Which but, is not uh, lucky. Exactly. I mean, and you right. may as well it's, learn and have, how important, like for instance, one of my favorite things to tell people about, and I know a lot of folks don't even have this set up, younger folks for their loved ones, okay? You don't want to wait until a crisis comes and the hospital or a financial situation and you're trying to deal with it when your parents are maybe incapacitated or not available and you don't have power of attorney. I mean... To right. just go through some of the steps, like what you can help people talk about, just that is one of the most basic and I think most important things, right? If, if you want to say, where do I start besides right. a will? That's it. Because with that, life becomes so much easier. Without it, I mean, you're pretty much screwed. <laughs> well, yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm just or saying, to speak be. bluntly, um, without that, and you're trying but, to deal with financial, the bank's going to say, wait a second, this is in the name of your parents. I can't just do this. They're, they're independent people. I'm not going to give you access to their bank accounts. Or no, I, I need to get permission from them to do this surgical procedure. You know, I can't take it from you. But if you have power of attorney, right. then you can speak for them. You can. And I think a lot of times people have a misconception about powers of attorney and what they are and what they're not. They think they're giving away authority. Well, powers of attorney are designed for um, the individual to share authority with a trusted person. Right. And uh, it can be effective immediately or it can be contingent upon some sort of event. But absent that document that shares legal authority for the business of you as a person, and we all have business, we have banking needs, we have real estate needs, we have tax needs. Um, without that document in place, you're likely looking at a conservatorship when that disaster strikes, you know, the the crisis event that's not a time you have to do the power of attorney while the person has capacity because they have to understand that they're sharing authority with that's someone right. and what kind of authority are they are they providing for is, is it limited to certain transactions or is it going to be very comprehensive for everything the statute allows or are we even going to go further and say we're going to grant some extraordinary powers because you don't know you might need those in future planning needs uh, which is very common in our realm of the law and if you do not have those in place and you say well i don't need them now so i'm going to wait until i need them yeah. well effectively you're going to you're waiting until it's too late That's right. and then you'll be asking the court for permission to take care of the business of your loved one whether it's a spouse or parent or grandparent those um those documents need to be in place and the other thing is that allows you to pick the person that you trust um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your spouse. Maybe your spouse is um, old as you are or older than you are, and it's not necessarily a good fit for them to be a task with that. Maybe it is a child or a friend. Um, it's someone, the point is, it's someone you pick. Right, and that's what you want, to have control and picking that, someone you trust, and boy, does it make a difference. And by the way, as we go to the break, it it's not a really difficult thing to do. You get with a legal team like Barbara and, and Tim there, and it's basically a basic document. The, the parties involved sign it. Maybe there's a notary. You get it. You make copies of it, and you submit yep. it to the banks, the hospitals. They have it all on file and record. And from then on, when you need to use it, it's there. And it's it's not complicated at all. That's one of the I think probably more you know, one of the more basic things you guys provide for people. 
It is. And yes, and I can tell you about a do-it-yourself mistake. Uh, I had a consult yesterday. Um, intelligent people involved. They thought they knew what they were doing. They downloaded a, a power of attorney from the internet. It was one spouse naming the other spouse to act on their behalf and explicitly in the document prohibited uh, the spouse serving as the agent for the other spouse to make any sort of gifts to themselves. Well, who who would you rather gift to than your spouse? Right. And it could be the, the need to transfer a house to protect uh, in, in the, the asset itself, if we're looking at long-term care. It could be just the use of retirement funds for some stated purpose. So it was a very limiting document they had no idea what they were just, they just downloaded a document and used it and they yeah. didn't realize how it could impact them. So a lot of times you're paying for the counsel of an attorney, not just the document. That's an excellent point. And there are some online where maybe if you look at it, you can figure it out, but it's not expensive if that's what you're doing. And having an attorney right. like you go over it to make sure it's how you want it, it's not going to set you back a ton. And then you have that peace of mind. Listen, we have to take a break. When we come back, Barbara McGinnis is with us. Uh, we've got a couple callers, Ricky and others. We'll try to get to you if you stay with us through the break. More of our conversation about elder law. We'll talk about estate planning, especially for those with special needs, as well as uh, undue influence. We'll talk about what that is, these legal terms that affect us all. We'll take a break and be back with our guest right after this.